Good morning. Welcome to Modesto Central today. It's good to see you all here. We have a lot of visitors, and that's nice to see. We love having the series uh, youth here to sing together with us. Yeah, amen. It's great. So happy to have you. So, God is good, right? You know, one of my favorite verses in Jeremiah says that the Lord says, I love you with an everlasting love. And in John 3, 16, it says, for God so loves the world. So, good to see you, James. So to greet one another today, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, behind you, beside you, look at them and say, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. God is, God is love. So I've got a couple of announcements for you today. First, I want to say, uh, remind everybody that there are connect cards in the pew. If you're joining us for the first time, if you're looking for a church home, if you feel God working on your heart, if something touches you during the service today, um, I invite you to pick up one of those connect cards, fill it out. Um, if you'd like somebody to contact you and help you with your next steps in God, then fill that out. You can hand it to me as you walk out the lobby, or you can drop it, put it on the, the desk in the back, and I'll definitely be in touch with you to help you in your journey with Christ. We're here to help one another in our walk to God and towards God and with God. So um, please keep that in mind. And then I've got a couple of great announcements. We don't announce everything, and I hope you caught all the scrolling slides going on there, but there's a couple of things that I want to call to your attention. Next week, we're starting two things that I'm super excited about. The first one is our Farm Fresh um, Share and Swap. We're going to have a table in the lobby for anyone who has extra produce growing in your garden, growing on your trees, or you just drive by and see a good deal on something and you buy it, but you can't, your family can't consume it all. Right now, there's a lot of expense for groceries. Anyone feeling the expense of groceries, right? There's a lot of expense for groceries. What we want to do is be that Acts Church where we share our things in common. So we're going to have a table out there. We're going to have some bags. You can drop stuff off. You can take stuff, even if it's not for yourself. If you know a neighbor that could use cheering up or somebody that's in need could use a little extra food to make their budget stretch, you can take it for any reason, even if you're just craving a fresh tomato and you're not growing them yourself. Whatever reason you want, it's going to be back there. Bring stuff, take stuff, share stuff. We're going to start this every first and third Sabbath. If it takes off, maybe we'll do it every week. So um, I'm really excited about that opportunity to share together and care for one another in that way. The next thing we're going to start is the Collegiate Sabbath School. Amen? Amen? I'm so excited about this. It's going to be held in the uh, conference room, newly painted and updated conference room in the office right over there. And um, Chantel has been working to make a little breakfast bistro menu. So um, there'll be food there for the collegiates that come. You'll get to pick what you want to eat. The topic is going to be called Better Answers. And so what the, what the program's going to be about is basically anything that, that you have questions on, that collegiates have questions on, that they don't feel like they've gotten good answers about. It could be things that we believe, it could be cultural things, it could be ethics. Anything you feel like you don't have good answers on, then I'm going to take your questions and we're going to look in the scriptures and dig in together and find better answers. Sound good? Sound good? I think there's going to, like, people are going to be peeking in going, can I go to that Sabbath school? It's going to be a lot of fun. So, so if you know collegiates, have friends that are collegiates, or... Have, have no collegiates that haven't been to church for a while, please welcome. Come on in, grab a seat. Don't feel like you have to wait in the back. I'm glad to have you here. Happy Sabbath. So if you know any collegiates, spread the word. It's starting uh, next Sabbath at 945 in the 
the office right there. All right, so the other thing that um, the Bible says is, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So I want to invite you in this time of prayer, you can stay seated, you can kneel where you're at, but I also want to invite you, if you have something heavy on your heart today that you want to bring before God, and you just like that uh, physical action of actually coming forward and laying it before God. You're not laying it at my feet. We're all bringing it to God's feet, but you're welcome to come forward and kneel here and, and just place that burden before the Lord if you'd like. So whatever position you're comfortable in, wherever your heart is leading you in this moment, um, we're all going to come to the throne of grace together. Dear Father in heaven, we know, Lord, that you are a good, good Father. And so we come boldly to your throne of grace in our time of need. We come with the burdens and the stresses and strains of life, and you know each person here, you know what they're going through. God, your word says to cast all our care on you because you care for us. So, Lord, you see every life here. You know what people are lifting up. You know those grieving, those who are missing their loved ones. You know those who need healing. They're praying for it for family members, for themselves. Maybe physical, maybe relational, maybe financial. And Lord, you are the great healer and you are the great provider. So enter in to these areas of our lives with your healing hand. God, as we cast our care on you, whatever it may be, whatever we're going through, we want to leave it in your hands right now and know that you are taking it from us. Because you don't mean for us to carry all the burdens of this world ourselves, but to know that our God cares for us. You told us to be anxious for nothing. So as we leave our cares with you, fill our hearts with a sense of your peace, that you see us, that you hear us, that you know us, and that you are with us. Lord, you know some of us are coming before you with burdens feeling like failures, feeling like we've let you down, feeling like we're struggling with our walk with you. But here we are, back again, coming to your throne and and saying sorry. And Lord, for those of us, you say that you've promised that you will finish the work you've begun in us to be encouraged and remember that you will work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure, that you are a good father who gives good gifts to your children. Therefore, you will empower us with more of the Holy Spirit than we've ever felt before because you give this great gift to us and you want to say, I forgive you, I understand, and I'm still on this walk with you. So Lord, thank you for your encouraging promises that you will, in fact, Put in us a new heart. And Lord, some of us are here just full of praises. And even those of us who came in with struggles just through this prayer time, maybe our hearts have been turned to praise. And so we want to lift our eyes to you and say we love you, Lord. Thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for your great faithfulness, your great love, your tender love to each one of us as your children. We want to give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for being in this place. We pray your anointing on on President, our conference president, Dan Cerns, as he brings us the word today. We pray your anointing on him that you will speak boldly and that we will hear what you want us to hear. We pray your anointing on those singing and the songs and the rest of the service. Lord, may we hear your voice singing over us with love. May we hear your voice speaking to our hearts just what we need. And Lord, we pray that the birds of the air and the cares of this world won't take those words away, 
but that they will go deep in the soil of our hearts and that we'll leave here changed because we've been here fellowshipping together with our good, good Father and our great Savior. We pray all these things for the glory of your name in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sabbath, everybody. Good morning. Okay, so this story is actually a true story. Um, We don't really know the main character's name, so we're going to call him Senor Garcia, okay? And Senor Garcia lived in Spain, a beautiful country filled with beautiful architecture and buildings that towered and shadowed the whole town. But Senor Garcia was actually poor. He only owned two hammers and a radio. And Senor Garcia, he was a shoemaker there. So he made shoes in a little shop that he owned. And with his little radio, he would turn that on and would listen to music as he made his shoes all day long. And one morning, he actually heard a hymn interrupt his music. This is a little rare, but sure, why not? The hymn was pleasant, and then eventually a man got on and started to give a small lecture about God's love. And he started talking about things of the Bible that he's never heard before, and no one had ever told him before. And he really liked it. So he remembered the station he had it on and said, you know what, next week I will turn to the same station and I'll listen again. And he did. And week after week, he learned and he grew and he started to really enjoy these wonderful stories of the Bible, of of God's love and bravery from all these men that had gone through these crazy situations. He loved it. And as he started to learn more, he really started to think who God was and if he could be his God too. And one long day after making shoes, he started putting his nails away and his two little hammers exactly where they went because he was very organized. He heard a knock. And he opened the door. And on the other side of the door, there was a young man, about 19 years old. He had books. And he told the man, hi, I'm selling these books. Would you want to look at them. So the shoemaker was like, sure, why not? He sat down and started looking through the books and looked at the first row of the first page to see what it talked about. And he realized that it was about all the topics that he had heard on his radio. And he was like, whoa, you know what? These books are really interesting. They're talking about everything that I've learned about on this radio. And the young man said, is a program called La Voz de la Esperanza, which means the voice of hope in Spanish. And he said, yes, yes, that's that's the radio station that that I listened to. He said, oh, well, I know several people that work there. And the old man said, great, because I have many questions. And so the young man said, okay, don't worry. If you don't mind, I can tell him to come over and answer any question that you may have. Do you want me to tell him your information? What do you think he said? Yes, yes, bring him over. This is my address. 
So next week, the man showed up at his house and started giving him Bible lessons to him and his wife. And the, as the weeks went by, he started to grow and learn more and fall so much in love with God and who he was. He knew for a fact that God was the true God. And while he was sitting there in his table made of wood with his wife and the young man across from him, he said, I have only one issue. And the man said, well, what is that? He said, about Sabbath. I don't get it. Everyone in the world know it's, knows it's Sunday. And only you think it's Saturday. And I've been working my entire life, me, my dad, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, Saturday, every day. Why would God do such a thing if it was his day? Why would he allow it? I don't think this is correct. And so the young man told him, flip your Bible to Exodus 20, and I want you to read it. So he flipped his Bible. He said, read it slowly and clear, you and your wife. And so they did. Remember the Sabbath day to, by keeping it holy. Six days shall, la shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work. And as he sat there and pondered and really soaked it in, he realized this is the truth. There's no ifs, buts, periods in between. This is it. And so he looked at his wife and told her, I really do believe that Sabbath is the Lord's day. And with her tears in her eyes, she told him, I've been feeling the same way. And so he said, that's it. I am not going to work Saturdays. No more. I know this is the truth. There are the facts. No more. This was a Thursday. Saturday came along. She was getting ready, putting her dress on, looked at the red, blue, green. Which dress am I going to wear? And she chose the red one. And as she was getting ready, his mind started to ponder again. I have many shoes. My workshop is filled. I don't know what to do. They're going to come on Monday, and then they're going to see that their shoes aren't ready, and this is money that we need, and we need to pay the house. And his mind just went on and on and on and on, so much that he convinced himself that he was not going to go to church. And he told his wife. And he was so embarrassed that he couldn't even look at her in her eyes. He had to tell her, hey, darling, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to go to work. And the glow and the gleam in her eyes went away. Why? You said, we know this is the Lord's day. And he just was like, I'm sorry. There's bills to pay. There's things to do. I just can't. He will understand. And he left. And he went to work. And when he got to work, he was so used to making shoes that he could do them with his eyes closed. He was just sat in his chair, grabbed the nails, put them in his mouth, slid them, hammered them, hammered them. When it was time to finish the shoe to grab his other hammer, it was gone. It wasn't there anymore. And he knows that he's super organized and it's always there. So he looked everywhere and he was like, maybe I'm forgetful, whatever. Had a super stressful day because he had to work with one hammer that wasn't even the hammer that he needed and came home all angry and mad and upset and frustrated. But he did it. He told his wife, this will not happen again. Then next week, he worked really, really hard all week long. This Sabbath, I will go with you, he told her. But as Sabbath came, oh, but there's so many shoes. I have so many shoes to do, and I, I know these people are going to need them. They're going to want them. Do you think he went to church? No. He went back again to his same routine, even though he knew the truth. And as he went back, the same thing happened. His hammer was gone. He didn't know where it was. Whatever, he started working and used his other 
hammer. And as he was about to hammer the shoe together, and he knew exactly, he put, put the nail in his mouth, grabbed it, put it on the shoe, and as he hit the nail, his hammer literally split in two. And he threw it. That's it. My hammer didn't want to work. My first hammer didn't want to work last week. This second hammer doesn't want to work this week. I'm not going to work a Sabbath in my life again. He closed up shop, and he picked up his wife, and they went to church. So he finally made it to church, to the same church that held the program from La Voz de la Esperanza, the Voice of Hope. And there, him and his wife were baptized. And as a gift, guess what the pastor gave him? A hammer, yes. They, they gave him a hammer and said, we're giving you this trusting that you won't work on Sabbath again. And this is just a good reminder for all of us that sometimes when things get really hard, it's not that God doesn't love you. It's not that you're just having an awful day on a Sabbath Sometimes he wants to grab your attention and remind you that he's the one that deserves your attention on this special day. All right, you can all go back to your seat. Father, share. Testing. Good morning, Central. Uh, we are from CBCA. <laughs> On the piano, we have Lucas. On the guitar, we have Sabrina. And down this row, we have Nathan, Jacob, Hilson, Lewell, Ladir, and Sarah. And, oh, and Pam, of course. And my name is Madison. And today, we'll be doing your song serve. So if you could please stand and join us. Every knee 
voices. Continue to sing with us as we go into our next song of praise.
it one more time. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praising and thank you for worshiping with us. learning spiritual leadership. I'll tell you, that's what it's about, isn't it? You know, they don't, they don't need to sit and soak and sour until they're old. They can start young. And they don't have to sit and soak and sour if they're leading, if they're sharing from their heart about Jesus. And young people, as you're singing those praises, you can tell by your face that you're thinking about the words too. That's a beautiful thing where that all goes together. I'm Pastor Dan. People wonder what to call me. Just call me Pastor Dan. And I am thrilled to have a new assignment working at the Central California Conference, Seventh-day Adventist. As president, people say, well, what does that mean? I said, that means I get to visit all of the churches and see all the good stuff happening. And I get to visit all the schools and see all the good stuff happening. And I get to visit the hospitals, not just when I'm sick, and see all the good things happening. Some people don't realize there are more Seventh-day Adventist hospitals in Central California than any other conference in North America except Florida. So we have a wonderful ministry, things that are happening. I'm, um, I'm privileged to be here. I was signed up to preach before your new pastor was assigned. And so I'm just thankful that she's been gracious to open up the opportunity for me to speak here. And I have with me my beautiful, gorgeous, intelligent wife right back there. Stand up, sweetheart. We met at Pacific Union College when she came up to me in the student center and said, hi, are you Dan Cerns? And I said, yes. And she said, I worked for your cousin at, in the doctor's office there in Glendale, California. And I said, well, nice to meet you. And standing next to her was this big buff surfer dude guy looking at me as if to say, don't get any ideas, you little wimp. <laughs> so I didn't. And so that's why I was surprised about four months later when she called and asked me out for a reverse weekend where the girls asked the guys. And um, that was an interesting story when her old boyfriend showed up and tried to beat me up and wound up in jail, but I got the girl. Whole nother story, okay. It's a whole nother story. But you know, God is good. I'm still alive. <laughs> All right. Let me share just a few things before we get into God's Word. Um, anybody this week or the last two weeks, had a divine appointment where you knew God set up a conversation between you and somebody about him that you couldn't have put together yourself. Anybody have a divine appointment? Look at that. I'm going to grab one of these mics. I'm going to grab the orange mic, and I'm going to make sure it's turned on because I'm just going to interview one person, and I see Jeff right back here. You raised your hand. What was your divine appointment? Well, this last week, I, I sell solar. And uh, I was actually called by my good friend, Daniel Garcia, about a difficulty that he had. But I have a supervisor who I've known since we were teenagers, and he's also a devout Christian. And we pray about all the things that we do. Nice. I have a quota that I need to sell every month. And yesterday I sold at, at the last minute. It happened. And I just knew that that was a divine appointment from God. Mm. So I praise him for that. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And there's some more stories of changed lives. Okay. Um, if you want more divine appointments, and I saw a number of you raise your hands, it'd be fun to just hear some of those divine appointments, wouldn't it? Sabbath school class or after the service or whatever. Just let's talk about the things that God's doing in our lives. And if you want more divine appointments, I've found there is almost nothing better than getting in the habit of carrying these little glow tracks in your pocket or purse or your jogging shorts or whatever and having them right there. And when you pass somebody, you just say, here's something to brighten your day. Here's something to brighten your day. And I'm going to ask these young people. Um, I see that there are two, a sister and two brothers. I just learned that when you had us greet each other. And I'm going to ask if you will go and just, if 
when you went, they walked by, if you want a few of these glow tracks to give out this week, you just kind of raise your hand and you just give them two or three or four unless they're desperate for more, okay? So why don't you just walk on by and, and as they just raise their hands, you just give them, and we want all of those to go out. But this is a great way to open up conversations. So for example, um, my wife and I go walking in the mornings and, um, and so I, I see people, I say, here's something to brighten your day. That's standard what I say. Here's something to brighten your day. Somebody says, what is it? I said, it's, it'll just brighten your day. If you like it, pass it on. If you don't, then you can toss it. And, um, but this morning, before we left our place down there in Clovis, we're out walking. And then I, I went over to a, a liquor store in the neighborhood. I don't usually go to a liquor store on Sabbath morning, but sometimes I do. <laughs> and so I went into the liquor store and I've given enough glow tracks to the guy who works there. His name is Singh. He's from India. And over time, I've been to the liquor store enough to give him glow tracks. That's all, my only mission. That I've learned his name is Singh. He's from India. He has worked in that store for 35 years. And he knows lots of people and some he shouldn't know. None of those people should, he should know because that store should be shut down. But because it's open, I'm going to at least have some agent for God if he gives his heart to the Lord. And then I went down to the donut shop. And no, I didn't get donuts. But I've just gotten to pass out glow tracks to all the workers there and all the people there. And for the first time, I met the manager. And he says, so I love what you're doing. He said, we just allow people to put in the, um, our daily bread, devotional books right there. And he showed me right there. And I thought, you know, there are people who are open. And now I think they're more open than ever. Most people. Some are. You know, some don't like it, but 95, 98 out of 100, they'll take them. And, um, and somebody says, and, and you know, there are about 30 different titles of glow tracks. And somebody says, which ones do you like best? And my answer is always the ones that are given. Okay? I always like those best. Okay? They can be sitting here and there and there, and I like them, but I like those that are given that are best. So if you want more divine appointments, you carry glow tracks, you just give them. You know, and, and watch what God does. Let me give you a quick overview of a few things happening around Central California. Um, we've been here 10 months. We're loving it. What gorgeous scenery. A lot of beautiful people. God's doing so many good things. How many of you were at SoCal the last Sabbath or two? Okay, some of you. Yes, we've seen you there. And we did everything we could to reopen SoCal. And we got two Sabbaths, and I'm thankful for that. Next year, I hope we get the whole thing. But one of the key people in us getting as far as we did was your previous pastor, Benji Maxa. Because we gave, he's not only communications director, and we're thankful for you being willing to understand that we needed that, but he was one of the four people who really were driving forces in getting camp meeting in place. So we're thankful. Everybody has a role in God's work. God wants us to all let our light shine for Him. We have 10 million people in our territory that need to know that Jesus loves them. He's coming again soon. He has a good plan for their life, and now's the time to take Him seriously. And we'll never have enough money to hire enough pastors and teachers and Bible workers to get that done. We never will, because that's not God's design. God's design is that every converted man, woman, and child learn to let their light shine 24-7. It's really what his mission is. So turn to somebody in front of you or behind you and say, he's talking about you. You're supposed to let your light shine. Just tell him, tell him right now. Okay, and continue on around the conference. We had Soquel. Camp Wawona was closed. But you know the fire came and it was burning right there. And if you look at the aerial maps, you will see that the fire came right up to the line for the camp and stopped. And that was a miracle from God, but it was also because of the fire people. They told us, we don't want this camp to burn. So if you'll let us, they just brought in all of their trucks and their hoses and they took the line, the camp line, and they did a back burn up to the fire so all the fuel would be gone and that's why it comes right to the line. 
Isn't that wonderful? Because we couldn't have Camp Wawona in, at Camp Wawona, we took Camp Wawona on the road, had three weeks. And one of those was right over here at Central Valley Christian Academy. And so I think we've opened up a new understanding that we could have Camp Wawona and Camp Wawona on the road at the same time, and they would help more kids. And that's what we're about. In these last days, we don't want to just keep doing the same thing. We want to multiply ministry because we know that time is short. Let's make it count for Jesus while we can. Another thing is Monterey Bay Academy. How many of you attended Monterey Bay Academy and maybe graduated? Okay, a few of you. Any, how many of you have been on the campus of Monterey Bay Academy? How many of you wished you, your house had a view like the campus of Monterey Bay Academy? Okay, it's gorgeous there. We have a new principal, Dan Nicola, very seasoned educator coming as, from Oregon Conference as Associate Educational Superintendent. And I know we have great day academies, including right over here in Ceres. But there are some kids who would very much benefit by a boarding academy experience. And so at Monterey Bay Academy, we're wanting all of the kids there to learn how to lead children's Sabbath schools, teen Sabbath schools, adult Sabbath schools, teen preach, go out in the community, meet needs, pray with people, start Bible study. So those are some of the things as well as strengthening the STEM subjects and vocational training at Monterey Bay Academy. Another thing that we've been praying about is knowing that we need more people preaching the message. Jesus said the last sign, Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached, not just in a pulpit, not just in a church, around living room tables, dining room tables, wherever. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So we invited people this spring to sign up for volunteer evangelist training online. And we trained them for seven weeks, one hour a week, and then we brought them all together on a Sunday in Clovis and did a day of training and gave them all their slides and their scripts. They could make their own and all of that. And 150 people preached their series of meetings this spring. Some of them did it in teams of two or four or eight. Some of them did it alone. But it was an incredible experience. We're doing it again this fall. And if you want to know more about any of these things, you just go to our new website, put together by a young guy named Benji, um, <laughs> cccadventist.org. And that's, that's where you go. There's a little button you can even click. It says, get involved. And then you can get involved, okay? But you just look at that in all kinds of ways to get involved for the Lord. And that's what it's about. That's when it gets fun um, to live for the Lord. One other thing I'll mention, and then we're going to dive into God's Word. There are parts of the world that have had almost no opportunity to hear the Adventist message. If you've been to an Adventist church three Sabbaths in your entire life, you know way more and have had way more opportunity than some whole countries. So we are going to every year, summer to summer, pick one or two regions of the world that have not had very many opportunities. And we're going to invite our churches and schools to adopt uh, cities, towns, churches, groups in those parts of the world for special prayer and then communication and perhaps even a trip over there to make a difference. And the two places we've adopted this summer to next summer are Eastern Mediterranean region, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Kurdistan, Iraq. For every one Seventh-day Adventist, there are 125,000 people that need to hear. Okay? And the second place is Ireland. Ireland. For, one, for every Adventist, there are 9,000 people that need to know. And yes, there will be a mission trip to Ireland in April of next year. Everybody who goes raises their own funds and groups, small groups will go out to the 10 different sites and they will help work in the community during the day, 
have meetings in the evening, and pray that by the last Sabbath at least one person is baptized to begin making a difference. So these are things to pray about. All right, now let's get into God's Word. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The year was 1874. Steve Marsh was ecstatic. For most of his life, he had just bumped along, didn't have much of an education, had a hard time keeping day jobs together, but he had just been informed that he was to go to the law office because his favorite aunt, who loved him, who was very wealthy and didn't have any children, had remembered him in the will. Things were about to change. So he made the trip across town at the designated time. He went to the law office, and they unsealed the will, and here is what the will said. To my beloved nephew, Steve Marsh, I will and bequeath my Bible, and his heart sank, a Bible, a family Bible. There it was, leather bound, brass clasp, Bible. I bequeath my Bible and all it contains, well, yeah, it's got a bunch of books in the Bible, with the residue of my estate, after my funeral expenses and just and lawful debts are paid. He says, okay, um, what? So I, I get everything else too? Yes, you get everything. Oh, okay. After the debts are paid. Oh, what are the debts? So after all the debts were paid, Steve Marsh was left with $300, which doesn't sound like much, but in 1874, that's equivalent to today $10,000. So that's not bad. It's not enough to last you a lifetime, but it's not bad. So he was happy, but he was frustrated too. So he, that, it wasn't too many months and years before the 10,000 was gone and he was back to bouncing around from job to job to job to job. And 35 years later, when he's well up in years, he was going to go and live with his son and he was packing up his few belongings when he came across that family Bible. And he just thought, wow, never opened it. Why should I? I'm going to live my life for myself. But let me just at least look at it. And he opened up the brass clasp, he opened it up, and he found some money inside. And he found some more money, and some more money, and some more money. And this is on record. He discovered $85,000. My Bible and all it contains. $85,000 in that time is $3 million today. His whole life could have been completely different if he had opened the Bible if he had appreciated the Bible, if he had valued the Bible, his attitude at receiving the Bible made all the difference in the whole trajectory of his life. And that's the case with us too. Because some of us would rather have $85,000 or $3 million than a Bible. But you know there's so much more in the Bible. And so I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles or on, on your device or in your hand to Acts chapter 17. We've challenged our pastors and all across our field this year to dig deep into the book of Acts and Acts of the Apostles by Ellen White because we believe that what was happening in the early apostolic church and happened in the early Adventist church will be relived in the last days, Adventist church. And so we want to dig deep enough to see it. And here in Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 10, 11, 12, there's this reference to how the people in the little town of Berea received the Bible. Not looking for the money, but looking for deeper, eternal treasures. 
Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night from Thessalonica to Berea. That's about 50 miles. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. They went to find people who they knew valued the Scriptures, um, at least to begin with. These in Berea were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Notice what they did. They received the Word with readiness. They had open hearts. They said, this will be valuable. I want to learn. But then they didn't stop there. They didn't just say, what do the preachers say? They went and they checked and they double checked and they made sure they were experts in the Bible, not just the preacher was the expert in the Bible. They made sure that, that where there's a cohesion, a connectedness, the right attitude, the right mentality toward the Bible and toward searching the scriptures on their own. In Acts chapter 17, Paul and his missionary journey, it's his second missionary journey in the about 51, 52, 53 A.D. And as they're traveling, they come over to Europe. They've been in Asia. They come over to Europe. They establish the church in Philippi. That's Acts 16. In Acts 17, they're in three different cities. First, Thessalonica. Second, Berea. And third, Athens. And each place, there's a different mentality on how they receive the Scriptures. In Thessalonica... They went into the synagogue for three Sabbaths. Paul shared that all these things you've been studying from the Scriptures. Now, in those days, the Scriptures were what we call the Old Testament. That's what they had, the Old Testament Scriptures. And he said, all these things you've been studying from the Scriptures were pointing toward the Messiah. And you don't have to keep looking in the future for the Messiah because the Messiah has come. But if you look carefully in the scriptures, you'll see that he wouldn't just come as a king. He would come and suffer and rise again. Just like when we really live for Jesus, we shouldn't be surprised if we suffer. If some people make fun of us, some people give us a hard time, maybe even family members, relatives, bosses, about the Sabbath work, whatever it is. We don't... We know that there's going to be, that we might suffer with Jesus, but we know even if we die, we'll rise again like he rose again. And so in Thessalonica, as Paul was preaching this, it explains that some of the people believed, many of them did, and some of them did not believe. When the Bible is truly taught, there will be a division. Not that we try to divide people, it's just those who say, with readiness, I want to accept it, are different from those who say, ah, that's not the, that's for, no, no, no. So there was a division. And the upper hand was held by those who weren't ready to receive the Bible and weren't ready to follow the Bible truth. They weren't ready to search and see what was true. And so they, they, those who did believe with Paul and his missionary team were driven out of the synagogue and they had to look around for a place to meet. So they went down to the local Christian church. No, there weren't Christian churches. They went down to Jason's house, whoever Jason is. You know, most of the early churches were in homes. As you read the New Testament, the church in so-and-so's house, the church in their house, the church in their house. And even in Jerusalem, where you had the temple, it says that they met daily from house to house and at the temple. Paul says in Acts 20, I taught you publicly and from house to house. There is this relationship of back and forth, home and church, home and church. Small gathering, larger gathering. And in the last days, we will need to have house churches that meet during the week. And then we can gather on Sabbath as long as we're given permission. One thing COVID should have taught us is that sometimes you can get shut down like that, and then what, what's going to happen with your church? But if you're meeting in small groups and house churches during the week, and then you're gathering on Sabbath, it's not a problem. And we know that. Many years ago down in Managua, Nicaragua, 
the church leaders, the Adventist church leaders knew that the Sandinistas were coming in and that they were going to shut down this Adventist church. Large, beautiful church, 600 members, served the whole city. And so they said, we need to organize our elders and our groups. And so they're meeting in homes when that happens. Sure enough, Sandinistas came in, locked the church right up, and the church went into the homes. They're, they'd already started, or went right into the homes. For 11 years, 11 years, they could only meet in the homes. At the end of 11 years, the Sandinistas were thrown out. And they looked around, they discovered that they had a church in every neighborhood and they had 2,000 members. You know, God has his way. When I took a group to Peru to preach the message, we went to Trujillo, the city in the north there, and they explained to us that the whole church is in house groups and that most people will visit an Adventist home 10 times before they'll set foot in an Adventist church building. And I said, aha, no wonder it's hard. We'd keep trying to have them make a bigger leap. Come to our church. Come to our church. Why not come to our table? Enjoy some food. If you know how to cook, do that. If you don't know how to cook, order in. You know, whatever. <laughs> whatever it takes. Find a way to invite them. Open our homes and our tables and our hearts to people. Can you imagine in our conference where we have 30 thousand members 33,000 members and about 12,000 homes and 150 churches can you imagine if in just a month or two we went from 150 churches to 10,000 house churches meeting during the week would our 150 churches begin to grow and thrive because the interconnection with neighbors and co-workers and relatives and friends Yes, yes, you can do it. You don't have to worry if your house is clean enough or big enough or too small or not nice or whatever. Just open your heart and then open your home. Love people. See what happens. And as you invite them there and you get acquainted, they'll come with you. They'll come with you here. Fill up this place and the balcony and everywhere. It's just a a law of relationships. So in Thessalonica, Paul and his company were kicked out of the synagogue, but it was for the blessing. They went to the house of Jason. It says there in verse 5. And so there, that's where they met until those who had kicked him out got angry. And they, sent, they went over, they started looking for Paul and his team. And they couldn't find him, so they take Jason. It says, verse 6, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Praise the Lord. We want to turn a world that is going down the tubes upside down so it's headed toward heaven, don't we? That's what we do. We're not here just to criticize or cause trouble. We're here to turn people around to follow Jesus. They say, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. These are Jews looking for the Messiah, but they're more concerned about obeying some guy over in Rome called Caesar at that time. Isn't that amazing? There are people who say they're looking for Jesus and love Jesus and following Jesus, but they're more concerned about this religious leader or that religious leader or that person or that person or that whatever. And so they lost their focus on the Messiah, Jesus. And they've troubled the crowd. And so that's why Paul and Silas had to hurry up and leave. But from the Thessalonica piece of the story, we can learn house churches during the week meet together on Sabbath. From the Berea part of the story, which we just read, verses 10 through 12, we can learn about how we receive the Bible into our hearts and how we study it for ourselves. We need to make sure that the Bible is easier to find than the TV remote. We need to make sure that the Bible is better used than the, TV, the computer screen. We need to make sure that we are spending more time in God's Word than watching those TV programs and movies and all of those things because there's only so much our mind can comprehend. 
And if we spend more time looking at the screen, whatever size it is, instead of God's Word, then we're going to think more and more like Hollywood and less and less like Jesus would. And then when we come to a crisis, we're going to think of a movie we saw instead of a promise we memorized. So it's important what we feed our minds. That was one of the, in our Sabbath school class today, that we need to gird up the loins of our mind. It says there in 1 Peter 1. That means just don't let our mind go all over this place. We can choose what we focus on with our mind, what we fill our mind with. And what we feed our mind is what will happen with our health. And so even just having a few verses that will make an eternal difference is, is wonderful. My favorite quotation by Ellen White is found in Great Controversy, page 598. Here's what is said. It is the first and highest duty of every rational being. In other words, if you have a brain, this is our first and highest duty. To do what? To learn from the scriptures what is truth. And then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow your example. That's pretty simple. Learn from the scriptures what is truth. By God's grace, walk in the light and encourage others to follow your example. She continues. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing scripture with scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. Wow. Wow. Storing this word in our minds. I um, had a professor at Andrews Seminary. Many of you have heard of him. You've probably read things by him. Named Richard Davidson. Powerful teacher of God. I took Old Testament theology from him. But he explained in his testimony, his personal testimony, that he was a young pastor who saw himself kind of as a hot shot pastor he knew he was smart those are the da most dangerous kind right and so he knew he was smart he was smarter than those other pastors he could go to the bible and he could analyze and evaluate and pick it apart and find the flaws and all the rest and then he was sent to a bible conference where there are presentations and he sat there at the back with his arms folded evaluating criticizing trying to figure out what to do and during that time, he said some of the presentations God used to have the Holy Spirit begin talking to him and saying, instead of you judging the Bible, the Bible is judging you. Hebrews 4.12 says it's like a surgical knife, that it will cut between joints and marrow. When we allow it to not be dulled, it will cut right to the quick and cut out those crazy myths that we believe in our heads about ourselves putting ourselves down instead of realizing we're children of God or that who knows if Jesus will come in the thousand years that's foolishness when you look at the signs and you look at the news it, it, the Bible has a way of changing our minds and he said there at that Bible conference he finally got down on his knees and he said I forgive me God and what a mighty humble champion for God he has been ever since he has brought out so many insights. I mean, here's one of them. He was explaining. He said, there are two creation stories. Most people who have read Genesis know that. Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-3. And then Genesis 2-4 to the end of Genesis 2. He said, there are critical scholars who will say, see, that's not a true story. Then whoever wrote that part of Genesis just collected various myths and he couldn't decide which one to use. So he just put both of them in there. And he said, but there's another better explanation. In that first creation story, there is a particular name for God that is used. And in the second creation story, there is a different name for God that's used because it wants to show, the writer wants to show both aspects of God's character. In that first creation story, it's Elohim. Elohim. And this is talking about the grandeur and the majesty and the power of God to speak and it's done. To command and it stood fast. To say, let there be light and there's light. To separate the waters above and the waters above. He can do it. Elohim, all powerful. But then when you get to Genesis 
2, verses 4 and onward, it's Yahweh. Yahweh, the intimate, close God who will kneel down and with his own hands shape man from the dust of the ground and then with his own mouth breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam opens his eyes and there is his creator. Intimate relationships. And you know we need both. We need to know that God is both. He is big enough to rule this mighty universe and near enough and close enough to live within our hearts. He can do these things and he is all powerful. And when you look at different world religions, you have some that have gods that are mighty and majestic, but they're distant from you and they don't care about you. And you just try to appease them. And then you have others like the Greeks in Paul's day who their gods were just like you and worse and involved with all kinds of immorality and lust and all kinds of horrible things. And yet they're supposed to be close and intimate with you. And yet here we find right there in Genesis 1 and 2, both aspects of God. Today you might need a God who is majestic to know you have, he has power to make a difference in your life. Or you may need a God who is close to you because you feel like you're alone. But whatever, he is that God. So Richard Davidson had that conversion experience. And in our class, he said, as Seventh-day Adventists, we identify 28 fundamental ways of following Jesus. And all of them are in the book of Genesis. Most of them in the first three chapters. So he began to open our eyes so that we would search the scriptures with readiness of heart. And that's what, what happened in Berea. And then finally, we get to Athens. In Athens, Paul was taken over there. He sent for the others to come join him. And as he's going through the city, something troubles him. He sees all of the idolatry, all of these temples and gods. Now, Athens had lost its, its edge. It used to be the, the cultural headquarters of the world. And Alexander the Great and others had built all of these things. And, and there on the Acropolis in Athens was the giant Parthenon. And that, that hilltop was filled with temples praising the gods and praising the different generals and all the rest. So Paul gets there and he sees all of these gods, all these idols, and it's bothering him. He says, these people are supposed to be educated and they're worshiping stone and gold and silver. And what, they need to know. And he, he finally began talking with people. And it, the attention of others was drawn to what he was saying. Finally, they took him to the Areopagus, which was considered a very holy space. And from the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, still there today, you can see the Acropolis and you can see the Parthenon right there. And so Paul begins to talk to them. They said, so what, who are you and what do you have to say? What's your message? And he says, well, I see you're very religious because you're worshiping everything. You even have an, an altar to the unknown God. And I want to talk to about that unknown God. And so you look over here in Acts chapter 17, and he begins to describe the true God who made all things. He says in verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. In other words, the true God created everything. And what are you doing trying to carve stone for him when he created that stone and he created you? And then in verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He's the sustainer. You wouldn't be breathing right now if it weren't for God. Your heart wouldn't be beating right now if it weren't for God. You wouldn't be able to walk if it weren't for God. In verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. In other words, it's not this race and this race or this ethnicity and this ethnicity, this color or that color. There's one blood. We're all part of the same family. And then he says, if you seek the Lord, you will find him because he's not far from any of you. 
In verse 28, for in him we li live and move and have our being. And Ellen White makes this tremendous insight in the book Acts of the Apostles where he moves his hand as he's talking and he gestures to some of the idols. Well, we had the chance last uh, October, my wife and I, to be on Mars Hill in Athens. And there's a plaque that has in Greek the entire sermon of Paul right there. But when you look over to the Parthenon, there were carved marbles all the way around the top of all the Greek gods. Now the British, when they took over that place, took those marbles and they put them in the British Museum in London. And if you were to go to London, to the British Museum, they have a special room for the Elgin marbles. And Greece says, give them back. And United Kingdom says, let's talk about it. Okay? So there they are in the British Museum. But those were in the Parthenon when Paul is gesturing. And when you see the Elgin marbles, you can see here is Zeus sitting, sitting still because he is immobile. He's immovable. And there are people coming from both directions to give him food so he can eat and animals so that he can have animals and he might eat some of those too. And they give him all of these things, but he's stuck. And Paul, as he's preaching, he says the true God isn't limited to idols. He created all things. He sustains all things. In Him, we live and move and have our being. He can go anywhere. He's not stuck. We're stuck if we don't have Him. He was trying to help the people see that God is so much bigger than we ever imagined. A few weeks ago, I was going to be speaking at our Sonora church. And as my custom is, on Sabbath morning, I get out and I go walking, do some jogging. And, and as I was going through one neighborhood, a lady at a house set back from the road just a little bit kind of stepped out there and, and, um, to water some plants. And usually I'd have glow tracks, but I knew if I was running up the driveway at her, she'd freak out and run inside and call 911. So I figured that's probably not a good story to be published in the local paper. So I just, uh, as I went by, I just waved. I said, hi, God bless you. Have a great day. You know, you can do that too. And she said, you said God. I love it when people talk about God. People don't talk about God much anymore these days. And I knew that was my clue. I said, well, I've got something else for you. And she said, what is it? And I said, right here. And I whipped in and I walked up the sidewalk and I gave them. And she says, what are they? I said, they're like spiritual vitamins. She said, I like it. What organization are you with? And I said, have you ever heard of Seventh-day Adventist? I am one. <laughs> now she's in her 70s. And, and so I just thought, well, I'm going to see you in just a little bit in church, but I won't be wearing my jogging shorts and my white V-neck T-shirt. And I said, great, tell me about it. And she said, well, I just became one in, in a few years ago, 2019. And I thought, well, there's a story. I want to hear that story. So I said, well, tell me the story. And she said, what's well, interesting. I grew up, I, I love God. I went to church, I was involved in church. But 20 years ago, there was a young man who worked with me feeding the seniors. And he was a kind young man. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, Judy, I just want to give you a book I think you're going to read, and I know it'll bless you. And he gave me The Great Controversy. And I took that book, and I looked at it, and I took it home, and I put it on the table where I have my Bible and study materials, and it sat there for a little bit. And then I, I got to it in a few months. I was trying to raise my grandchildren, custody disputes and everything, but, but there it was. And as I started reading it, the first thing I noticed is God is a whole lot bigger than I ever imagined. That's what was happening on Mars Hill in Athens. God is a whole lot bigger than we imagined. And she said, so I read it through, and I read it through, and I read it through, and after 18 years, I knew what was in that book. And she said, one day the Holy Spirit said to me, Judy, you know enough to make your decision. You need to remember the verse, come out of her, my people. She said, I said to the Lord, I did come out of the world. And he said, you know what that means. 
It's not coming out of the world. It's coming out of anything where there's religious confusion and living for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. She says, I knew what I had to do. And I said, wow. So she said, I went to my church. I thought, well, she went to the church over here. She said, and they didn't like what I said. I said, oh, it's a different church. And so she said, I'm becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. They said, you're joining a cult. And she said, no, I'm following the Bible. They said, no. And she said, you read the Bible. I'll share it with you. We're not interested. They weren't noble like the Bereans. And she said, why don't you come with me? So she said, um, so I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, so when were you baptized? And she said, when I was eight years old in the Baptist church. I thought, oh. Uh, I said, so then when did you join on profession of faith? And she said, what's that? And it began to dawn on me, here is a lady who is a Seventh-day Adventist sharing her faith who has not been connected with the Adventist church two miles away. Never. She did tell me she'd gone online a few weeks before and she saw the new pastor and heard his testimony. But I just thought, wow. And I said, well, have you gone to the... No, not yet. And I said, why not today? She said, what time is it? I said, well, 9.30 is the Bible class and those are good, but 11 o'clock is the worship service. She said, I might go. And I said, please come, I'm preaching. She looked at me in my jogging shorts and my t-shirt. She started laughing and I did too. And she said, I'll be there. And I said, well, then can I take a little video clip of your testimony of what you shared? So right there, I took that video clip and you can go to my Facebook page and you can watch Judy to give her testimony. And at 11 o'clock, she was there in church. And she ran into her physical therapist who was a member there who had had Bible studies with her sometimes when she would come for treatment. And she met the pastor and she is on a journey to make it official. Why do I tell you this? Because she said it so well. I began to realize that God is a whole lot bigger than I ever imagined. That was happening with those missionary journeys back then. That needs to happen with us today. God is so much bigger. The Bible shows him to be so much greater, close and powerful. He is everything that we could ever want. He is the one who is willing to leave the adoration of billions of angels and come down to a dark earth to be mistreated and abused. And if you've been abused and you've been mistreated, I am sorry, but he understands what it's like to be mistreated and abused. He knows what it's like to be whipped and beaten. He knows what it's like to have nails driven through his wrists and through his feet. He knows all of that. And he still loves us. And he's alive again. So that means he calls on us in these last days to live for him 24-7. 24-7. Wherever we go, say something good about Jesus. Find a way to introduce him into the conversation. Get into the scriptures. Don't just take what I'm saying, but dig deep. And maybe this afternoon, reread Acts 17 and get more of the pieces and parts. And, and where we are champions of the word, not to argue with people and debate, but to lift up Jesus and to show how beautiful and big he is. How many of you here today just want to say, Lord, I know you're bigger than I've ever imagined, but help my mind to begin grasping you better. Would you like to say that by raising your hands? Amen. Amen. How many of you like to say, Lord, I want to feed my mind with your word more this week than I have for a while and, and cut out some of the things I've been feeding on? Would you raise your, mind, your hand too? Thank you. Let's pray. Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for your priceless word and all it contains. And Lord, we think of that man, Steve Marsh, who sat with that family Bible unopened for so many years and it could have changed his life. Don't let us be people who don't touch the Bible much. Don't get into it much. Help us, Lord, to shut down whatever we need to shut down and turn our attention to things that may not be exciting at first, but as your Holy Spirit is welcomed and as we receive it gladly, transform our hearts rewire our minds so we are thinking like you and we're seeing that you're much bigger than we ever imagined and we're so full of love for you that comes from you 
that it can't help but spill out in all of our conversations and activities. Thank you for forgiving us our sins. Thank you for cleansing us of all unrighteousness. Thank you for wrapping your robe of righteousness around us. But Lord, help us to not just keep going through that cycle when your word is there ready to change us and take us to higher ground. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.